Lumion is a great rendering program that we are going to use to make photorealistic renderings of our SketchUp and Revit models and Rhino too. And uh, you can go to their webpage where I think you'll find that this software is intuitive, fast, enjoyable, and somehow different. And uh, of course, the webpage always has these lovely demonstrations of what the software can do and videos and 360 degree panoramas and all that. Um, and in order to uh, get the software, uh, we don't need a trial. We can go ahead and get a free student license. Uh, if you go and dig through their website, you'll find that there's a page where you can apply for a free educational license. I believe if you click through on the student uh, section here, they have more wonderful explanatory videos and images saying what it can do. And then uh, down here, you can you can request a student um, student license. Just click through, and I'm sure there's forms and all sorts of stuff that you have to fill out. Uh, and while you're at it, there are other things that you can add. Um, if you are a Revit user, you can download something called Live Sync, uh, which allows you to synchronize your Revit model with uh, with your Lumion uh, interface. Uh, Lumion is not a real-time rendering engine like some other programs we know, um, but it will synchronize with your model and it will update with as your model changes, uh, but only if you get this handy-dandy live sync. So let's start with the Revit Advanced Sample Project. It's a lovely and somewhat complex building that we can uh, look at in Lumion, and I have installed the Lumion launcher. It's over here. There's a new add-in plugin or add-in for Lumion, and there's actually only a couple buttons, so it's a pretty easy one. Um, there's the live sync button, which will launch Lumion. Uh, there's a synchronize the live camera button, uh, so once it's launched, it will synchronize. You can also turn off that synchronization. Of course, I don't know why you'd have the two running if you didn't. Uh, there are some live sync settings. There's not not really a lot to uh, to worry about here, uh, except for how how smooth it is, frankly. Um, and uh, finally, you can import Revit models into your Lumion interface without actually having Revit, without using live sync. You can just convert them to a Collada file, which is a lot of expectations there, and. Uh, once you export that file, that can be imported directly into Lumion without launching it this way. Um, and I guess if you have a file from someone else who can't sync with your model, you can send it that way. Anyway, I'll click the sync button and then tune back in. It, it takes about a minute to launch. And I'll allow it to start. I've placed the Lumion window, which is here on the right, next to the uh, Revit window so that you can see how the two of them work. And what you'll see is that, in theory, when you orbit or rotate the model uh, or in zoom out uh, in the viewport, you'll see the uh, image synchronize with Revit. Now, one thing you can do is turn off the crop region. I'm going to hide it, and then I'm actually going to turn it off. And in the Revit interface, you have kind of the infinite view, and this uh, synchronizes a lot better with Enscape. And again, you can see whatever you change will change in the other view. Now, you may also notice that some things are missing, for example, these trees, and that's just because apparently those are not valid objects in the land of Lumion. And another thing that you may notice is that the ground has disappeared, and that actually has to do with in Lumion, if I come in here and select the building, um, it's actually underground. <laughs> so I would have to uh, move it up. And, and this is because Lumion has its own uh, kind of ground system that uh, it, it uses. And also you'll notice I was able to independently move here in Lumion. I can scroll in and out. I can even double click on a spot on the ground. And in theory, it kind of translates my position to that location. Uh, if you double click with your uh, right mouse button, I'm also clicking and dragging with my right mouse button in order to orbit. Um, if I hold, if I click and drag the scroll wheel up or down, it will kind of pan me. Holding down shift makes that go a little faster and shift and plus makes it go even faster. 
However, many people are probably going to be most comfortable with using the arrow keys, which helps you to move around the model, and the same shift and shift plus spacebar works. Anyway, when I click back in the Revit model, it puts me back into the synchronized mode, and anything that I do manipulate here in the model, uh, if I, for some reason, wanted to delete the roof, you will see that um, it, when it gives me an error message, which is fine. Um, but uh, that change will be reflected here in the Lumion model. I lose my roof. Um, I, I don't actually want to do that, so I'm going to undo and bring my, my happy roof back. And uh, there you go. I have the models synchronized. And one thing to notice is that if I close Revit, which is fine, uh, Lumion will keep going. It doesn't need Revit to be open and active. So here's the interface where just the Revit model is available. And you can see it's basically a big empty world with uh, one building in it and a, and a big parking lot. Uh, one fun thing that you can do here in Lumion is add other models from other programs. Uh, right now, I'm when you look at the interface here on the left side is kind of the, the main toolbar, really the only toolbar. And there's a couple of basic operations. The home operation is the content library, and the default button here on that home toolbar um, is the select tool. And I can select my model, and I can take a look at it. Um, I can change which layer it's on. There's a bunch of layers up here that just kind of appear when you uh, move your mouse over the top of the screen. Um, and, and you don't really need to worry about the layers for now. You could put all your imported models on the same layer. Or you could have all your furniture for, say, one floor or another organized by layer. Um, I find that it's not super uh, important. Um, the other thing to notice is that if I uh, did call up that Revit file again, I could re-synchronize the models. Uh, if I call up this same model, and it does have to be the same file name and everything, uh, and click the Synchronize button, like magic, it will sync the two views. It will also sync the geometry of the model. Uh, and here in the advanced properties, there's there's some other things that you can learn about um, the model, including uh, replacing it with a, a new model um, or just re-importing it from another file. Um, of course, you can also lock it if you don't want anybody to mess with it. Okay, let's talk about SketchUp models. Now, one cool feature of Lumion is that you can import new models into your Lumion file. And right now in this uh, Imported Models tab here, um, I can go from the Select button to the Place button. And, right, and you'll see up here in the Import menu that uh, there's basically a couple of models in my project. I can, I can make them a bigger thumbnail. And I believe that these are uh, things which have been placed in, either in this model or in different recent projects. Uh, and I can just import a new model. And what's cool, I have a bungalow, which we'll take a look at in a minute in SketchUp. Uh, but I can just import it just like this, right into my main model. We'll say, do you, is, you know, is that what you want to do? And uh, where do you want it to go? And of course, there are also uh, categories and layers that it can go into. I'm just going to click OK to get the default value. And uh, what you'll see is that that other building is now attached to my cursor and I can place it anywhere out here in my project. I think I'll just place it here in the front yard and lo and behold it is now part of my uh, Lumion model and I can navigate around or I can just double click in front of it Whoops, with my right mouse button. Got to remember to do that so that I can see the building. And you can see here it becomes, I could have a whole little kind of cityscape <laughs> going on, a whole neighborhood uh, with these multiple projects. Now a fun trick is I have opened up my model here in SketchUp. And uh, by the way, I got this model off of the 3D warehouse. Thank you very much. I believe this is Anne H or someone like that who did this model. Very nice job. And of course, I love the 3D warehouse because there's so many, so many goodies on there. Anyway, and I if you've seen any of my other videos, I've used this same house to explain how to create, uh, say, a video or standard elevations and sections, that sort of thing. Anyway, what's cool is if you go and you get the Lumion LiveSync 
for SketchUp. And that's here in the extension warehouse. It's a freebie and uh, you just click install and it, it, and it becomes another, another toolbar. Uh, and those of you familiar with using extensions, you know they're super handy. You can just find it here in your uh, toolbar launcher. Uh, and the fun thing is I can launch LiveSync and I already have Lumion running. And what will happen is like magic, the two will become synchronized. So I've placed for convenience the Lumion view next to the SketchUp view. I have launched LiveSync. And now if I click on the camera synchronization button, it may take a moment, but the two views should come into live synchronization with each other. And sometimes you'll find that it doesn't happen right away or you have to start kind of orbiting your model or looking around in order to see what's happening. Um, and like with Revit, I can independently kind of jump around and take a look at things here in Revit. But as soon as I go back to SketchUp, it will synchronize. And this is true if I happen to go to some view. Let's see if we have one that is like an interior view. Just click on that. And like magic, it will take you inside or you can go back outside again. So it is kind of handy if you have a complicated model. Um, you can go and kind of jump around pretty quickly. Let's go back to our original view here. There we go. And they can synchronize independently. Uh, one thing to notice, by the way, and this is true for both SketchUp and Revit, is that uh, Lumion is not overly fond of having the ground drawn in. Now, in the case of my SketchUp model, I don't actually, there's like, it's basically flat. So it's much better to use the Lumion ground. Uh, and the reason is it's easier to apply materials and manipulate it, and it kind of blends more seamlessly into the background. So any changes I make, if I delete the ground here, or I delete any of these objects, uh, you will see that they immediately disappear in my Lumion model. And saving my SketchUp model, and I can just hit Control S to save, will not save the Lumion model. You have to remember to save that independently. It is an independent rendering file. And changes that we work, make further on, they, uh, if we make them in the Lumion interface, they will not return back to the SketchUp model. And that is a big difference from Enscape, for example, where it's a live, real-time renderer. What you see in your model is what you get. Here, the two be, uh, become separated. And especially you can see here, I've, you know, I've got more than one model in this project, so it actually gets a little hairy to try and think that they're going to synchronize. So frequently what we will do is uh, kind of decouple them, do the basic building modeling here in your originating program, either SketchUp or Revit. Uh, and then in the Lumion interface, that's where we're going to add some of the other goodies. And there are actually a few kind of things that you can think about as sort of general strategic ways of working with Lumion. Uh, one is that you have this uh, single model, but it's no longer your SketchUp or Revit model. It's going to be the Lumion model. And uh, the advantage of that is that you can, of course, import SketchUp or Revit into the same model. You have the access to the whole 3D warehouse world of happy modeling, uh, happy 3D models without having to try to figure out how to get them to work in Revit or how to figure out uh, how to take advantage of Revit's robust 3D model creation features uh, inside the SketchUp interface. Um, that said, it also is important to try to use Lumion objects when possible. There are a large number of objects that we'll get to in a minute, um, but this includes furniture and trees and other landscaping elements and also the geography. Lumion has some actually very robust tools for creating the landscape around your buildings um, or your landscape design, if that's your thing. And those are only going to want to happen in Lumion because it's, it's really much better. As you saw earlier, it doesn't respect the landscape or site elements as well as it, as it could. Uh, and uh, you can use those as reference to create the landscape in Lumion, but you'll, you'll be creating them alone in this 
in this model, which means they will not show up in your SketchUp or Revit models. Now that when you think of what, what do you need from those models, you need plans, sections, elevations. So either you're going to have to get used to getting them out of Lumion, or you're going to have to perhaps do some you know, fancy footwork to recreate all the stuff you've modeled here in Lumion. Uh, finally, lighting. Lighting is one thing Lumion, it does very well and does much nice, more nicely and more easily than the Enscape lighting that we have used for SketchUp models. The bummer is that it does not respect Revit lighting at all. So you will have to recreate lights that work in Lumion. And for a big project, this is not insignificant. Now, on the other hand, the frustration of getting Revit lights to work and work successfully is, uh, is, is, is no small uh, source of anxiety. Also, the lights that you can create, you can use glowing materials, and of course that's a handy way to create fixtures that are lighting up in a large scale um, or glowing, glowing materials such as uh, lit signage. So some general things. Finally, materials. Lumion has some very nice materials in its library, and it only works if you have painted the objects some sort of material in the originating program. So for example, the SketchUp model is fully painted, although it's not fully textured in that these materials are quite simple, you know, SketchUp textures. And even in Revit, where we can create fairly layered textures and materials, the main thing is are surfaces that you want painted, are they painted different colors. So sticking with the shaded view in Revit is probably the best option. That will tell you if your objects are painted different colors, but you don't have to worry too much about the sort of inner workings of materials. Those are actually much easier and more fun, frankly, to fix in Lumion. So where to start with your modeling process here in Lumion? Uh, basically, we work in build mode, and then there are several other modes. There's a camera, and uh, that collects still images. There's a video mode, which will collect uh, video images. Um, there's a 3D panorama, which is a virtual reality mode um, that you can export. And finally, you can save and load your projects. And, uh, but in build mode, this is where you add things. And if you look at your menu here, the, the menu, the only toolbar, uh, like we saw before, you can place a model. You can also, when you select a model, you can move it. So the house, when I click on that, there's a little blue dot. You'll see the, the gizmo pop up here. You can move the model around. You can also force it to only go vertically uh, or horizontally if you want. You can sink it into the ground. And this is great if you've created some contours. Uh, and the, the process is exactly the same with the Revit model. So it doesn't, it doesn't actually kind of discriminate uh, one model type or the other, which is nice. You kind of only have to learn one technique. So how can we add a few simple objects and then create a view that we can export using Lumion. Well, it's pretty straightforward. We're already in this object placement menu here and uh, the content library. And let's just place a few trees, give a little context here to our, our little house. And uh, the way that the tree placement works is um, if the menu uh, doesn't show up, mine didn't show up because um, I must have closed it. Uh, just double click on the tree. And, and this is the true for any of these types of objects, but we'll, we'll stick with trees. And uh, you can click on a tree, and of course they, they have some interesting trees in here, so it, it may actually not be a bad idea to you know, give some thought to what kind of tree you're going to place. Uh, but if you click on the tree, and with this single placement option, you can just move your cursor uh, over here, oh, I don't think I actually selected one, um, and place it in the model. Now there are some other placement options. There is the, uh, the I'll choose paint first. Paint placement allows you to kind of click and drag and place a whole bunch of trees. Um, here, let me clear that. And um, 
oh, or not. And then uh, there's also when you go and you are, let me click the checkbox to finish painting that. Um, there are other ways to paint, uh, and this includes one of my favorite, the mass placement. In fact, let's place some uh, some flowers. Oh, flowers would be nice. Uh, and the flowers, you can choose them, click the mass placement option, and you can actually, here, let's get rid of the tree, but let's add a couple of different kinds of flowers. I'm just clicking on them here. And what you do is you draw a line where you want the flowers to go and click once to start and once to finish. And I'll zoom in on that guy a little bit. Um, and what's cool, obviously very exciting, right? The plants are all in a line. However, there are uh, some modifiers here in the placement. I can add more of the plants. I can change the direction independently or I can, uh, or together, or I can randomize it so some go some way. Um, you can also space them randomly along the line so they don't look like they're kind of too nice, uh, nicely ordered. But then you can also offset them from the line, which is kind of cool because now you can you can kind of create a whole uh, kind of field of flowers here quite quickly. Um, and of course, I could have added more flowers later on. Finally, there's the confirm and return to build button. Boom, like magic, you've got yourself a lovely little flower garden. Isn't that nice? Uh, finally, I'm not gonna do the other options just now. We just want some simple output. We can come in here and we can change the time of day and the time, uh, the uh, azimuth, the altitude and the azimuth that the sun is coming from. Obviously, you would want something to be um, somewhat appropriate to where your project is. And, and then set up your view so that it has a nice, uh, nice vision of your project. Here we go, I'll, I'll zoom in. And there you go, you've got yourself a nice view. Let's export it. And uh, to do that, to export your image, you go to the photo uh, option here, the photo operational mode, I guess you could call it. And in this operational mode, you'll see you still have a live view of your models or model. Um, you can zoom in or out. You can also, interesting enough, easily change the focal length so you can get uh, kind of a more architectural feature. You can also easily move up or down. So you can you have some compositional options here in this view. The same keyboard shortcuts operate here. Uh, you can use the arrow keys or the WASD or whatnot. Anyway, when you've got it the way you want, come down to one of these blank view slots and just click store camera. And it makes an annoying click sound. I really don't like that, but what the heck? I haven't had, found a way to turn it off. And that is how you can save an image. So if we say go back to build mode and we you know, want to say, I don't know, select some of those flowers, we can go to the nature button. And when you do this and you go to select mode, it will only select plants which is kind of interesting and you can, it's a clever way of making it easier to, um, to have objects uh, selected more easily. And uh, anyway, you can manipulate these individual objects. You can delete them or move them around um, and, or you can uh, jump in and change them. But then uh, once you've done whatever it is that you're going to do, if you go back to the photo mode, it doesn't change your camera view. It's sort of like a saved scene in SketchUp or a saved view in Revit. Um, but any model changes that you may have made will be reflected in this view. Now, again, you can continue to manipulate the model if you want, um, but my uh, camera here, and I'll just click on restore camera, it will go back to where I was, all right? If I wanted to save that new view, I'd have to go over to a new empty slot and save the camera there. Finally, click render. It's really easy. You just click render and you can choose the size of your image. It's a fairly straightforward uh, output. There are other output types, um, including alpha maps for the sky, um, lighting maps, all these things which can be really valuable if you want to do post-processing in Photoshop. Uh, for our purposes, I think we're going to let uh, Lumion do all the heavy lifting. And I'm going to export a print image, save that somewhere. I'm going to call it test and yes, overwrite the file. And you'll see that it, it goes fairly quickly, even at this high resolution. 
and it will give us uh, a message when we're done and you can click open folder and find your image and here's the image that I could create I created and you can see it's a, it's a pretty high resolution not super impressive in terms of its photo realism however it does as uh, i mentioned have some advantages particularly the ability to work in multiple programs uh, but what we'll learn next is that you can actually really gussy up this image with some of the tools that lumion has to offer one last thing to do after messing around in Lumion for a while is hit that save button. Just click the save and load projects button. Uh, this will bring you back to the main menu. It, it's a little odd that they don't immediately jump into the save mode. So you could, you could easily load a new project without saving this one. Although I think it does warn you. But uh, the first time you say uh, you have saved a project, you click save as and you'll want to give it a name. Uh, and I'll call this Lumion Introduction because that's what it is. And uh, there we go. And uh, once you've saved it, you can always load it back in. When you click the load button, it will have all of your most recent projects. Uh, you can also merge multiple projects, which is also a feature I'm, I'm not sure I'd use that much unless I was doing a large scale, say, neighborhood project. The other thing is that you can check out some examples. There are some very nice models in here that you can poke around and see how they put things together if you're interested. One last peculiar thing about Lumion is that uh, you can see there's a tiny little counter uh, right here next to the save button and it, it doesn't automatically save. You have to click on that in order to have it resave and then, and then it starts the counter again. There, there is no auto save so, so absolutely make sure before you exit the program, and I'm going to exit it now, uh, that you save your model. And, and it will say are you sure you want to quit without reminding you that you should save. Okay, back in the start menu, which you get when you run Lumion. Again, you don't need to run any other programs at the same time, which is probably a good idea because Lumion is super system resource intensive. It, it uses pretty much every scrap of graphics energy that your computer has. How do you know if your computer is going to be okay to run Lumion? Just click on the benchmark button. And uh, what you'll see is information about your system, how much memory you have, uh, what your processor is, and um, the, uh, the system memory as opposed to the graphics memory. And uh, you can actually create a diagnostic file and send that off to Lumion for their perusal. Um, but for us, uh, the big thing that you can do to your computer if you are really struggling is to add a little bit of memory or if you uh, have the ability even change or add the a new graphics card to your computer um, and these are all things that if you go to the uh, performance tips you'll you'll find out now uh, things that we can do that are pretty straightforward under the settings menu uh, you'll see that there are some uh, basic quality settings that are available here in the menu so I would not set these up to super high quality, 100% uh, native, never use proxies, and always use all these uh, high quality trees and preview. This will almost certainly cause your computer to explode. So we don't want that. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn off these features. I'm going to allow uh, Lumion to use proxy objects when you're zooming around. Um, and even just going down from 100% to ultra mode is going to save your system resources pretty significantly. Now I have a pretty good graphics card in my computer, so I can leave it at 77. But uh, even if I put it down to 50% to show you what it looks like and low quality mode, this is the lowest possible setting. Uh, you'll see that the model actually looks pretty good uh, despite that. Again, with Lumion, the big thing is that you render separately from the kind of live build environment 
and that saves a lot of system resources. It may be with these lower settings that the computer takes a long time to render, but uh, that's okay. Finally, one other thing you can do to speed things up, and of course, if you're working on a laptop, you, you don't have that much area anyway, but you can change the size of the Lumion window that you have uh, operating, and that will actually speed things up a little bit be because it's having less area to render. Now, if your eyesight isn't so great, then it's kind of hard to draw in such a small environment, but uh, that's one another way that you can save some uh, energy uh, on your computer. One thing that's kind of annoying about not synchronizing with your original model is that it can be a little tedious to navigate the Lumion space. Uh, one trick that you can use is uh, because you don't have your saved views or scenes available when you're just running Lumion, um, you can save uh, cameras of different views. Uh, so for example, if I wanna be able to quickly jump to this view, uh, I can just click the camera button here, store camera, and uh, then I can, uh, these views are, are saved here in the photo mode, and, and I can jump to these rather quickly just by uh, selecting it, and then go back to build mode. Kind of a workaround for uh, those of us who are not as comfortable using the arrow keys and the shift and uh, the space bar and the shift button. Okay, so back here in build mode, let's try adding some different types of objects from what we've done so far. Uh, let's try adding some furniture. Now again, in select mode, when I switch to the objects, uh, furniture objects button, uh, I'll just double click on it to bring up my menu. Um, and here, let's make those images a little bigger so we can see what we're doing. Um, you do have to go to the place mode in order to make um, the menu show up. Uh, and then you can click on an object that makes sense for your project, probably. Uh, and you'll, you'll see there's just tons of objects in here. It does take a little bit of patience to be able to kind of zoom through and, and pick them. Uh, but when you have an object selected, you have the same placement options that we had before. So for example, I can uh, place them along a line and uh, you can change their direction and then the fun things is you can you can change the number of seats and even randomize the direction just a little bit. Uh, just a touch adds a little sense of realism. Um, you can even randomize the spacing just a little bit if you want it to appear like uh, a kind of messy crowd has in, uh, been in here. Um, and then finally, you can actually randomize them a little bit off of the line. It's entirely up to you. Now, all the objects that are in the Lumion library uh, perform in the same and they've conveniently organized these with uh, two uh, uh, categories that are, you know, easy to understand. If we if we want to add in some lighting or some plumbing, uh, we can add these into our projects quite easily. Uh, it's all sorted here. I think a, a nice uh, bathtub would be nice to uh, have in our in our room here. And uh, we'll just place it uh, right in front of these chairs. And don't forget when you uh, change uh, categories, place multiple objects. Uh, at one time, you will have to confirm the placement of those objects. There are some other types of objects that are object types that you can use. Uh, for example, if you select a chair and you, you maybe you want to move these all as a group, what you can do is you can go here to the advanced options. I'm in the select mode. Um, and you can actually select all objects either that are in the same category, which you can see it selects this uh, bathtub as well, um, or just objects that are uh, identical. Uh, here, let me deselect all and uh, do the identical objects. Uh, and then you can uh, group them, add current selection to a group. And uh, now these objects uh, move as one happy little group. You have the gizmo, which allows you to uh, move them around. Also, once they are grouped, uh, you do actually have some options up here to continue randomizing them. Uh, otherwise, they, they are uh, not, you, you can't uh, re-randomize them from your original placement unless they're a group. 
So there are a lot of object types, uh, nature, people and animals, transport, chairs. Uh, one cool thing with transport is you can put in cars and you can even put in license plates from your state, which is a, a fun feature. One other cool feature of this linear placement mode is the ability to uh, place multiple objects here. I can just select uh, people in my uh, browser here and add them in. So now I have like what six different objects, including I don't know what cows and, and horses and stuff. And uh, as you space out a room, now you have all of these people inside your space, and it's kind of interesting how they're all kind of doing stuff. Very, very interesting. But anyway, you can you can increase the number of items like before, uh, manipulate their direction or randomize their direction, um, and like we did before, spacing. Uh, but uh, as you increase the offset from the line, you you can actually kind of kind of fill the whole room uh, with different objects, even though it, it is frankly a little odd to have uh, horses but this is great when you're trying to set up a crowd uh, and you want it to look uh, like, a, like a real crowd uh, you can absolutely add a variety of, of items. Uh, but let's talk about lights. Lights are really an important feature here in uh, Lumion and the reason is that the lights that you have in your originating program uh, in our case Revit is going to be the one that has lights um, they don't work. <laughs> they just don't work at all. So you have to put in your own lights. And there are a number of lights. Uh, types, spotlights, omni lights, and area lights. And this is actually similar to something like Enscape, uh, which has the same light types. And uh, you can see there's a number of different distributions. This one's probably more like a wall washer, and these are more like a pin light. Uh, let's take a nice wide one here. and. I'll just place it in the model. You can see your cursor makes reference to different surfaces. So as you move your cursor around, you'll actually get a preview of what this light is going to look like. And that's a spotlight on the wall. And OmniLight, as you might imagine, just goes in all directions. And finally, the area light is one where if you just don't know what you want in your room, you can add this and this, this can kind of fill the entire room um, with light. Now, FYI, I accidentally put in an extra uh, Omni light up here. Uh, you can select it here and, and you know move it, uh, but I can also delete it. Uh, once you have selected it, just click on the delete button and it wants you to kind of confirm that you are going to delete it. Uh, and this is true for any placed object or group. Now, once you have the lights in your you can manipul manipulate them by selecting them and modifying uh, any of their properties. You can see here there's uh, brightness. Uh, fall off determines how close to the original source the light kind of disappears. Um, some lights appear very bright, but they, they kind of drop off quickly. Others are just irritatingly bright. Um, and these are kind of tweaks that you can make for the type of arrangement you want. Now, for sophisticated lighting schemes, you may want to start using layers. Uh, if you want to create, say, a wall wash and an area light, you'll get a little greater control if you can kind of select these lights more easily. But uh, most of the time, just one or two of these area lights or other lights will, will do in a room. And you can see each of these uh, performs pretty, pretty nicely. Uh, you have a lot of uh, kind of uh, tweakability. Um, you can even make them go automatically on at night. How are we going to see what that looks like? Well, uh, if you go to the Sun tab here in the build mode, um, you'll see that the sun height is one of the features you can just change just using a drag uh, operation. You make it nighttime and oh, look at that, the light comes on. And of course, the advantage of this is during the day, you're saving energy by leaving that light off. Uh, and lo and behold, you have it on at nighttime. Now, one fun thing about this is uh, you can save uh, that scene. I'm going to go to photo mode. I'll go to a blank slot and uh, I'll just store that camera. And now I can, I can kind of quickly jump to it as I modify the lighting here in build mode. I can always come back and 
check it out, see what the rendering looks like. Remember, because I, my settings are super low, what you see here is not always going to be the finished mode. So you have to go and check it over in the uh, camera, uh, the photo viewer, to uh, see what the render is going to look like. Anyway, each of these uh, lighting uh, features, you can move them around uh, like other sorts of objects. So select, whoops, select an object and um, uh, just click on the move features. And of course, as you move it around the room, uh, you should see different effects uh, depending on, you know, kind of the, the settings. Um, the one that's the most interesting is this room uh, mode here. If you look on the rest of the room, um, you'll see there's kind of a light on the on the back of the sky, and this is kind of a way you can you can add light to an entire room kind of all at once, uh, which is super handy. Uh, let's say let's go upstairs. I'll just use one of my uh, keyboard shortcuts. Q moves you up. You could also click and drag the scroll wheel. Uh, but I'll come in here and uh, let's place one of these area lights in this room. I can place it and with my select mode I can kind of change the brightness to uh, quickly kind of make a, a room all lit up without even having any lighting in there, which is great because there is no lighting in my room. And you can see here from the outside this, you know, this makes a pretty, pretty nice uh, effect um, and you can even continue to add lighting and um, uh, modify uh, modify the characteristics of the lighting as you as you go to get a nice render from different angles. So the next fun thing you can add are effects. So I'm going to put a little fire pit out here, and I, and I did this by just going to the objects menu, and there's a there's a search button up at the top. You can find one, but uh, going down to this effects toolbar, uh, and I'll make this. A, tad bigger so you can see what's going on. Um, there's all sorts of different features that are kind of funky animated features. There's water, you see there's all sorts of fountains here, fun shapes, um, but fire is one. You can add fire uh, and it's pretty straightforward what they look like. Uh, you can just add, let's, let's keep it under, under control here. Uh, you can click to place the fire in your model. And this is an object which like other Lumion objects can be uh, selected uh, once you go back to the select uh, option and you can you can control how big the emitter is I mean each one has kind of its own unique features uh, how much the fire spreads let's keep that under control we don't want too much of a fire in our area but anyway and how brightness how bright it is um, the size in terms of vertical height uh, which is really fun uh, and again you can go back to the place mode and look there's a smoke because you know where there's fire there's smoke uh, or I suppose where there's smoke, there's fires, is how it really goes. Anyway, you can you can place the smoke and, and you have the same options uh, for that uh, object type, uh, particle size, coloration, uh, the size of the column. Oh, that's a big fire. So we're, we, we definitely want to put that out as soon as possible. And there are a large number of these cool uh, effects, things like fog, uh, leaves. You can just kind of scatter leaves in the air, which is a fun one. And then you can have sound objects, which is great if you are doing, say, a virtual reality presentation. They're quite easy to place and manipulate. One other feature is uh, something called decals. If you click on decals, these are really interesting. They allow you to add kind of dirt or scuffing to your model, and they work kind of like Revit decals in that they're just an image that you place on a surface. However, they allow you to make the surface look like it's kind of a little dirty or scuffed, and you can control how much the decal blends with the background surface. And this is just another way to add richness to materials in, uh, in, the, in the Lumion uh, environment. The last object type are these utilities, which are kind of interesting. You can add a character billboard, which is kind of fun. You can place the billboard in your object and uh, load in image files just by clicking on the load texture button. Uh, and uh, you can, in theory anyway, get them to work so that it looks like the people. See how it changes the outline to uh, match whatever your image file was. A PNG file with a transparent background is, is necessary for this. 
And you can also add text, which is really only handy for uh, kind of setting up a presentation. Uh, one that I like is this clipping plane. Uh, and what this does, this allows you to, to essentially create a floor plan of your model. Just place the clipping plane, and now when you uh, zoom up, you have an overview of your model, which of course is kind of dark because it's nighttime. So let's turn that uh, sun back up. Ah, there we go. Now we can see our whole model and all the fun things that we placed in that room. And in fact, for an interiors project or a project where you're working the inside and out, that uh, view with the model clipped away, that's a good one to save here in your photos. Now, the only trick here is that it has added this uh, plane to our entire model. So we, we do actually want to get rid of that. Make sure you are selecting utilities uh, because when you force it to only select uh, utilities, you can, you can usually grab that clipping plane and delete it uh, right away. Oh, I guess I had another one in there. So let's try selecting that one and deleting it also. So the next feature to take a look at is the materials editor. And it's pretty straightforward. You uh, click on the paint bucket and it says click on an imported model to modify its material. And you just click on a surface and what you'll see is a menu pop up and every surface that's painted that material gets selected. So this of course means in your originating program you should be very careful and make sure you don't kind of paint things either willy-nilly or not at all. Because if you paint them not at all they'll all be unpainted and thus will all get selected at the same time. Anyway, um, there are some basic materials here. Uh, you can see up at the top there are some categories, various uh, which uh, tends to be exterior materials, um, although if you look at assorted, you'll see that there's some, you know, some interesting things in here, cork and sponge, uh, and this is, this is always fun to take a look at. Uh, obviously, indoor is pretty self-explanatory. You can see here, uh, there's, again, uh, sorted by indoor and outdoor, and then there's subcategories for wood, tiles, that sort of thing, and then, and then deep in this menu, um, are other uh, subcategories. So for example, the high quality ones are labeled with a D as opposed to the not so high quality. They're still quite good. Anyway, let's take a look at the outdoor ones and we can make this wall maybe a brick material and you can just click on it and you'll see, you'll find out pretty quickly how successfully you painted your model. Uh, and I can change that material uh, again just by clicking on it. Uh, quite easy to add Add different materials and you can edit this material just choose edit material and there's a bunch of uh, features that are very typical of your complex rendering settings uh, for example in Revit um, also in Enscape uh, we were able to control a lot of these features uh, some are how sticky outy the bricks are so the if I drag the relief feature this is like a bump map um, you can you can kind of make them look a little more sticky outy. Um, you can control their reflectivity. Obviously, every material has complex features um, and can be quite reflective. Interesting enough, there is a gloss setting which is separate from the reflectivity. I believe this just changes how the lighting um, it plays across the surface. Um, and then uh, displacement kind of changes uh, how how the, the map, the uh, displacement map, kind of occurs. This is kind of a tweakability for the, um, the image map. Finally, there are some further features down at the bottom. I guess they hide them because you, you can, I don't know, get into trouble with them or something like that. Um, and uh, these are nice because you can actually tweak the location of the map. And uh, obviously this is super handy. Um, when you want to make something, uh, for example, look like it has a corner course, you can uh, tweak it so that you have just the right amount. You can even type in a number and, and you can see here it, it kind of looks like you have a corner brick going. Uh, there's another, uh, other, there are other features. Again, you can really go to town uh, tweaking these, uh, the waxiness and the transparency. Uh, one that is um, uh, kind of nice is this weathering feature. 
uh, you can make things look like they are uh, kind of weathered. Um, it just adds like a little, I don't know, dirt and scuffing on there. Um, the other one is edges. You, you kind of don't really have uh, pointy edges so much in our world, in our environment. Um, these edges can be softened uh, ever so slightly. See how that's a, a kind of pointy edge? I, I drag it way down and it, and it makes it very softy, a little too distorted for my taste. Um, strangely enough, you can add foliage, which um, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, um, you know, how much how much foliage that I want on my on my wall. But you know, it, it's a it's a really easy way to add a high level of detail. Um, you can even tweak the size of the leaves and the type of leaves. You know, there's a couple of different different flavors of leaf, including autumn. Um, and, and then you can spread them out or not. So a lot of uh, deep features in pretty much all of the materials. And if you don't like the one you've, you've got, just click on the button up here, the blue button, Material Library. It takes you back to the uh, Material Library where you can go and you can select uh, various um, and, and, and choose whatever material you want. And when you've got things the way you like them, just click the checkbox and you go back to the original uh, kind of menu uh, where you can you can check. And this is this is a SketchUp model and, and things that you haven't painted are the default material. So you can see as I mouse over it, a lot of materials are the default material. So this is when you would want to go back to your originating model, open it up, uh, change the paint scheme uh, so that you can manipulate these in your Lumion environment uh, and then just click the synchronize button. You should uh, see your model pop up <laughs> synchronized live with. Um, and uh, some of the best materials are actually the, just the standard ones that you'll find in the library. Uh, for example, glass. I'm just going to click on the glass here and, and it recognizes it from the Revit model. Uh, and you can just go in the material library, choose glass, and then look for um, this pure glass, which is the, the kind of nicest glass. And it really has a lot of uh, tweaky effects you can control. Some of these have um, some frosting on them, which is uh, always delicious. Um, and they, they really uh, they have reflectivity and uh, all sorts of different features to them um, that you can, you can kind of really tweak quite easily. Uh, you know, even just a little bit of frostiness or uh, a little bit of a relief pattern, um, which kind of adds a, a crinkly effect, uh, give, gives your model a little bit more realism. Uh, so, so using those pure glass uh, from the materials library is the way to go. One really handy feature is how you can use uh, SketchUp objects and paint them very easily. I can import a model. I have a, a playground here that I want to bring in. Um, and like I imported before, you can just bring it right in and uh, place the model. It respects the landscape. And uh, then when I go to the materials menu, it, it respects all the materials that are in here. Uh, I can paint these in any number of ways uh, using the materials that we learned about. And uh, or we could use just a standard material um, and make it super glossy and uh, reflective. Um, and you can see it's really easy to manipulate this object. I don't have to do anything to the SketchUp model. And this is true for SketchUp models you bring in on their own or SketchUp models that are nested inside Revit projects. What this means is when you're creating your Revit model, you can load in SketchUp objects, just import them right in without any manipulation or fiddling around with tags and materials. Just bring them right into the Revit model and uh, Lumion will respect the original colors painted in good old SketchUp. Now, sometimes when you're editing a material, uh, you know, there's all these, these different flavors of material that you can use, um, including the standard material, which is, which is kind of the, the, the starting point. Um, and, and you can change the color and all that, but sometimes you want something totally custom. Well, now we get to go to the internet. And in the past, I think we've looked for seamless textures, and those work fine um, in uh, SketchUp and Revit. However, if you want something more photorealistic, you need to go with physically based materials. 
and uh, the there are all sorts of websites. This is ambientcg.com that you can get them, uh, and you can see there's some some really nice looking materials. Now a lot of these, of course, are, are available in the Lumion window, but let's say I want this custom uh, dirt pattern. I guess it is uh, for the slide. I think that would make for a much better slide experience. Um, what you can do is you can download the images. Now, if the slide does show up in, or the material shows up in the foreground, you, you'll probably want to get the 4K image. Um, uh, 1K is going to go a lot faster, which is fine for materials that show up in uh, distance. So you just click this to download it. And what you'll see uh, once you extract the folder uh, is a bunch of images. And at every website, uh, what they'll give you is uh, entirely different. But um, in this case, the, the main thing is the what's often called the diffuse image or diffuse color. Um, that's the base image. And then there's a number of different ones, images. You can see the descriptions here are pretty clear. This is roughness. Uh, normal is kind of the bumpiness. Um, displacement is uh, how much um, the surface uh, comes out. Probably roughness would be the, the most um, uh, best parallel. Uh, and each of these you can use in Lumion. And it's pretty straightforward. You just uh, here in the colorization, well, we, we don't want it to be blue. We want it to be whatever that image is. You can just click here to choose a color map. Brings up a little window and you can open up an image and just double click on it to enter the image. And a 4K image will probably take a little bit of time, you know, maybe five or 10 seconds. Uh, and you can choose these other maps as well uh, for the relief map. You can see it comes in blue and often that's an indicator <laughs> that uh, you want to choose the blue ones. In this case, it's interesting. I guess it's probably the direction you want the material to uh, go, I guess. And normal basically means direction from the surface that it's painted on. Uh, and, and each of these can be adjusted, right? You can you can control how sticky outy it is. And let's add some other maps on here for gloss and displacement. Now with the gloss, I don't see one here that says gloss, but uh, maybe something like uh, this ambient occlusion one, which uh, seems to have a lot of detail to it. And once all the maps are in here, you can you can really fiddle around with them and get a sense of what each one does. Uh, obviously, this is pretty reflective for sand. We can drag that way down. Um, certainly, the glossiness may also uh, want to change. Um, and then the displacement is how, how bumpy it's going to be. Uh, finally, the map scale. You can actually control how big the image is. Uh, this one, uh, just twiddling it a little bit. Uh, actually, it kind of makes it go away, so let's not do that. Finally, we can do our trick with the weathering feature. We can add in um, some kind of softness to the edges of the material, um, which will make it make it look a little, a little less harsh. Although apparently, looking harsh is is not a problem for for me. Uh, in this one, anyway, and then you can add in weathering. Uh, try to find one that works for this material, um, and it, you know it's quite effective uh, using exterior maps like this, if, if you can't find one in the material library with Lumion and you're good to go. One feature that is particularly handy and seems to be somewhat unique to Lumion is the ability to manipulate the landscape. Uh, and first of all, you can paint the default area and there's kind of like a one kilometer square area that's uh, the default grass, high resolution grass material. Uh, you can come in and, and paint areas of that, uh, different uh, materials. Um, you can control how big the uh, brush size is and the speed that it paints with. And if you click and drag, you can kind of create uh, rocky or grassy areas. Um, which is kind of a fun feature. You can also uh, come and uh, change uh, the color of the grass. Each of these is kind of a unique texture here. Um, uh, Thailand rock, that looks pretty nice. Let's add some of that over here. And again, it mine is painting fairly uh, slowly. If you click it faster, then really it, it kind of adds quite quickly. The other thing is you can control the height of the landscape in a similar kind of paintbrush method. And uh, you can either raise or lower the landscape. You can also undo what you've done by, by kind of flattening it or adding uh, greater detail uh, or smoothing out the detail. So here, let's, let's lower some of this, whoa, some of this landscape. I think I, my brush setting is a little on the fast side. I'll click the 
undo button here. Uh, let's let's slow that way down um, because uh, basically you can get into a lot of trouble here. Um, see how the, the land is kind of going down a little bit. And I'm just clicking and dragging with my left button and uh, you should see that the landscape is looking a little, a little bit lower. Here, we'll raise up some of the landscape around it. Here, we'll, we'll speed it up a little bit so we can see some options. And again, this is a way that you can kind of add uh, some interest to your project um, uh, without really having to go back to your model. Uh, most of our uh, modeling programs are, are quite, um, quite robust, but uh, landscape does uh, pose a lot of problems. Um, what's interesting, as I add uh, thickness to this, you see how it adds some, some rocky rockiness to it, which is kind of fun to do. Another fun thing to do is add water. Now, unlike Enscape and most of our other programs, this, when you click on the water tool, it, it actually adds a water object to your project. You just click to place it, and, it, and it's actually quite, quite interesting. The object can be moved up or down instead of kind of painting an area, what it's doing is responding to what you've, what you've created in your landscape. So if, if I stretch this out, now suddenly I have uh, quite a rich texture, um, which is adding water and, and through the water you can see the ground. So, so kind of a fun way to add a lot of detail or kind of interesting um, features to your landscape. Also, you can choose the water type. You just click on the water image here, double click on it, whoop, double click on it. And uh, there are a couple of options. Um, I guess I'm a little quick on my click, quick clicker. Um, you can change it, there we go. Now it's a little more uh, like New England in uh, winter. Adding in the ocean works in a similar way. However, if you have um, a uh, flat landscape, <laughs> suddenly the ocean kind of comes and just, just devours us all. This is about 100 years from now. Uh, this is what it's going to look like. So uh, let's turn that off, uh, unless you want to go and manipulate your landscape to um, uh, have some height to it. And here I'll, I'll go into my landscape tool and I'll pull up the landscape in front of the building. Here we go. We'll get those dump trucks in there and put some fill. And you can see that uh, now, uh, even the trees go with the land and, and you know, we're still going to have to clear up our basement. But anyway, oh, look, now our floor, flowers are doing much better. That's nice. One last feature that's really nice for exteriors of buildings, particularly urban buildings, is this open street map uh, feature on the landscape tab. You just turn this on and it's going to say, hey, I need to find open street map. Um, this is a beta feature, so you have to click the OK, I understand button. Uh, and then you can actually just click inside this window to choose a GPS coordinate. And here's OpenStreetMap. You can see here's our little, little map and we can, we can tune in here to wherever our location is. So here we are in beautiful Beverly, Massachusetts at Endicott College. You can just click to place the kind of target and you'll see the background refresh with what the, uh, what the building is. And then uh, when you click the Start OSM Open Street Maps Download, it will download all the buildings and other goodies into your project. So I'll just tune back in in a minute. Fast. Actually, that was not fast, uh, but it, it doesn't take too long. And you can see you have all of your buildings in here and even some of the landscape. Now, the system may not have all the data about your buildings uh, and the site. So you, you can kind of tweak things to get what you want. Uh, if you want water or not, um, the actual earth in the background, buildings or not, um, roads and uh, land use. So you, you can kind of turn off uh, any number of features. Um, you can also kind of randomize the building heights. I don't believe you can control them independently, um, but you can kind of make them all <laughs> get a little bit bigger. Um, and interesting enough, you, you can uh, pick buildings and, and turn them um, on or off. You just click the toggle building visibility option. So for example, if there's a building, you're like, yeah, that, that's not right. Um, or for example, this building here is, has been rebuilt. So we, we don't, we don't want to use that one. Uh, anyway, you can just click on the objects and like magic, they disappear from the uh, visibility. And this uh, OpenStreetMap model will 
continue in your saved camera views. So you do have to make sure that you don't have any weird conflicts with the landscape like I have here. If you have spent a lot of time manipulating the landscape, you, you definitely want to turn off the water and the earth. Although interesting enough, sometimes the roads are are handy. I, I, I don't know. I, I go back and forth. In this case, we're, we're just citing this in the middle of nowhere, and I'm probably going to build out the water, so I'll, I'll just use it as is. The last thing that you can do to produce nicer renderings, in addition to the materials and the lighting and the objects and the landscape, uh, is over here in the photo uh, manipulator here, the photo mode, um, you can add what are called effects to each view. The simplest effect is actually to just uh, change your view composition. Uh, as you lay out the drawing, you can change the focal length, which is kind of handy, um, and you can move your camera uh, up or down uh, just kind of by tweaking these buttons, uh, which is super nice. Sometimes it's, it's just hard to get things as you like them uh, using the uh, mouse buttons. However, the biggest thing is the effects. Just double click on the effects button and you'll see there are quite a few different ones here. Uh, some of the ones that are going to be very effective for large landscapes are going to be the real sky, the sun, and depth of field. And each of these works in a similar way. You uh, click to place the effect. The effect comes over here. There, there's actually going to be a whole stack of these. And uh, you can just control uh, each, of, each feature of this effect uh, independently. So for example, if I drag this slider over, you should see objects in the distance kind of start to get blurry. And how blurry they get, well, that just depends on you know, how much you drag this slider. You can also kind of control how precisely the foreground and the background are. And, and, you, can, and you can actually specify very specific amounts for, for each of these. Um, so if you want uh, some very specific element to be in focus or out, you can, you can kind of um, turn these on or off, or you can just put on the autofocus and allow it to figure it out itself. Um, and this can be a really interesting feature. You can get kind of a tilt shift. Things in the foreground can be blurry or things in the, in the distance. Well, if you're extra tweaky, you can, you can come down here and change kind of the shape of the distribution of the uh, focal length which is actually quite complicated, so, and I don't even know how to do that. Turning on Real Sky is also a nice one. You double click on the Real Sky, and uh, you can actually pick the different kinds of skies. There's, there's actually quite a lot of interesting uh, features here. These are, these are 3D uh, kind of skies that you can select here. Let's do a dramatic one. You can see it really changes the whole scene, including the uh, lighting. Uh, now, this is getting a little dark. Fortunately, there are some tweaky things that you can add to uh, the scene. However, th this is probably a little, a little dark. Let's, let's go with a, a more of a, a morning view. Ah, there we go. Oh, that's so nice. Again, you can see it changes the angle of the shadows, and uh, you, can, you can, again, tweak the kind of overall brightness and the brightness of your sky. The other thing is, uh, I don't believe you have the ability to change the exact altitude and azimuth but uh, you can, uh, to, to match a, an existing location. However, you can come in here and tweak the sky. And this looks very photographic. And one that will allow you to tweak the sun with greater uh, ability is this sun uh, effect. And again, you can just change the heading and the height and uh, even the size of the sky uh, sun disk if you, if you happen to see it. So the, uh, angles are not actually as helpful as a geographic location would be, but um, they are actually quite nice. And uh, another fun thing you can do, if you have a bunch that you like, uh, this is actually kind of annoying, but each view is somewhat independent. So I have to, if I want these effects to be applied in another uh, view, I have to actually copy the whole effect list and uh, let's go down to another uh, saved camera, and then I can actually paste the effects list, and you see how it, it brings them all in here. Now, that said, sometimes you want a day view, and sometimes you want a night view, so uh, these, are, uh, these allow you to really tweak each view uh, quite independently. 
And there are a couple other features. Obviously, there's a lot of effects that we can play with. Uh, I'm going to go to this uh, interior view here to show you volumetric lighting. And one thing you'll notice, by the way, when you jump to a new view, it takes whatever your view settings are in build mode. So here I have manipulated the sun, you know, so that it was daytime or nighttime. Uh, all of those settings are uh, reflected in the, whenever I click on one of these cameras, it's, it's going to switch to that time of day and, and all that. So let's go to photo mode uh, for this camera and take a look at another effect, which is the volumetric lights. Now, I had to add back in the lights that I somehow deleted, and, and this effect actually works much better with uh, uh, point lights rather than um, area lights. So uh, if you click on the uh, Select Lights button, you should be able to come in and add the lights that you want. Now, it looks a little kind of fuzzy in this view because um, uh, I'm in low resolution mode, uh, but you can see it's going to add kind of an area of... Uh, I don't know, as if there was dust in the air in this particular view. And like the other features, you can, you can control how intense, where the fall off occurs, uh, and uh, also uh, the density of the, the kind of dust. By the way, that uh, kind of fuzziness will go away when you click inside the viewport, uh, the preview viewport, see how it gets a lot smoother. But one of the features I turned off was that auto rendering feature. So. Um, you do have to click in that. Uh, and I added a uh, sun effect to turn the sun back down again, so it's, it's more of a nighttime view. And obviously I don't have a lot of materials uh, on this interior, just the lighting. So a couple of other features that are really handy. First of all, the two-point perspective uh, app, uh, effect is really nice. It kind of forces your camera to be uh, perfectly, have those vertical lines perfectly vertical. Obviously, this is a really nice feature and works in both exterior and interior views. You should pretty much always use that for a presentation drawing. It looks very uh, architectural. For floor plans and elevations, the effect that you want to use is the orthographic view effect. Uh, and what you do when you, when you turn this on uh, or off, it, it obviously puts you into orthographic view, just like uh, really all of our other programs. And then to get the uh, floor plan view, you have to uh, orbit your model so that you're uh, basically going from the top view. But you can see here, it actually gives you some standard views. So if I go to zero degrees and then uh, make my pitch 90, uh, then you can, you can uh, make it a pure floor plan. And uh, what's cool is you can actually control uh, which, uh, where the clipping occurs. Whoa, I guess I clipped it all the way. And I can, I can kind of drag this uh, to the left or right to enable further uh, kind of clipping of the plan. Just click in here to get it to re-render. So you can see it's a, it's a pretty effective uh, floor plan. And like with these other effects, uh, don't forget to store that uh, camera so that it remembers what, uh, what you've done. The last effect is kind of a fun one that, or fun type of effect that you can try. Um, and uh, these are the kind of stylization ones. So if I uh, choose this one, you see how the, the image gets very, um, I don't know, pastel-y. And then, I mean, I guess that's the name of it. Um, or, you know, or this one. And um, what's fun is you can, you can kind of turn these off and on. They're, they're sort of like Photoshop effects uh, that are kind of pre created here for you. Uh, you can turn them on and off and blend them together to get some interesting uh, uh, sort of duplicate double effects. And these include uh, some of the artistic ones. Uh, I don't know how many people need the manga version, but the watercolor obviously is kind of cool. And again, uh, when you go back to the main view, you can you can add or subtract other layers to get some, you know, some pretty artsy fartsy drawings. Sometimes it's nice to be uh, a little less photorealistic. Finally, sometimes it's nice to think about some effects that you can use uh, perhaps in Photoshop when you're layering your drawings, uh, doing a little final post-processing. And uh, Styrofoam is a, a good one here. It kind of makes your model look, oh, I don't know, black and white, I guess. Uh, there also is a desaturate effect. Um, another fun one is this cartoon one, and you can kind of get lines out of the drawing. Again, um, I have to click inside the viewport to make the effect uh, 
take take effect. And uh, these are again great ways that you can get multiple layers out of Lumion for some dramatic presentations. When it is time to render your images, you, you should you know go through and check and make sure that the images are what you're hoping. Uh, but here uh, in the render photos menu, remember that you can do a whole photo set. Uh, you can just add or subtract images from this set, depending on whether or not you think they're any good. Um, and you can choose the quality. Obviously, the higher quality is going to take a little bit of time. Um, but at this stage, this is actually probably the best way to find out how well things like these effects are working. Uh, if your computer is like mine, it, it can only handle so much, and uh, this is a great check to see how things look. So just click the render poster and come back in, in a couple of minutes. So finally, I did render this uh, using the highest quality settings, and you will notice in the lower left there is a uh, Lumion watermark. So, of course, unless you want to be a walking, talking advertisement for Lumion, you will have to cut that out using the Photoshop uh, tools available, things like the heal uh, tool, healing brush, um, or just crop it away. <laughs> Make sure you compose your images so that they're big enough um, that there's a little extra. And that's your basic guide for getting renderings out of Lumion.